okay so today we are going to discuss the surgical management of the male luts yesterday we discussed the medical management let's start with a scenario the time starts now 58 year old gentleman with known benign prostate referred by gp he is on tamsulosin and finasteride tablets for past 18 months and he is known to have prostate size measuring 60 cc in the past with PSA of 2. He had complete evaluation when he was started on medical management. His IPSS was 20, quality of life was 5 and his flow rate showed a void volume of 315 ml with a maximum flow rate of 8 and a post word residue of 32 ml. He is enjoying quite good satisfactory sexual life with his partner. He is presenting to your clinic with um, an ability to have adequate improvement in the urine flow with a combination of tamsulosin and finasteride. How will you proceed? Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so I would see him in my clinic um, and with all of that history available, I would talk to him about um, what he's looking to achieve with his urinary tract symptoms. Um, whether he's interested in pursuing a more uh, in-depth treatment, a more invasive treatment than tablets. Um, I'd want to establish from him whether he has any other significant medical history that's going to impact cho choice of surgery, such as um, any use of anticoagulants. I, I want to know, um, you, you mentioned that he has a good um, sexual function. I'd want to know um, with him whether that's a priority and that him preserving sexual function is a priority or whether he's willing to um, prioritize his uh, treatment of his lower urinary tract symptoms. Okay, so it seems like he is struggling with weak flow. That's his main problems. He tolerated the medications for past two years. He do wish to preserve the sexual activity, so, and uh, he's not on any anticoagulants. Excellent. So, um, I'd have a conversation with him. I'd try and use the NHS England patient decision-making aid for management of um, lower urinary tract symptoms to go through the different options with him for um, intervention. Um, if he's looking to preserve his sexual function, then he, he's more likely to be uh, interested in one of the minimally invasive surgical techniques that are now on offer, um, particularly things like Resume and Neurolift. They both got excellent outcomes when it comes to preserving sexual function. Um, I would explain to him that uh, although they have good outcomes for lower urinary tract symptoms, they are slightly inferior when it comes to improving uh, flow rate and, and uh, IPSS than the more invasive um, techniques that involve removing tissue. Um, but I would go through those all those options with him um, with the patient decision aid. Okay. So what are all the various options you will be going through with him? So I would explain to him we've got like I mentioned, different options. So we've got the more invasive, um, more established techniques such as TURP and um, HOLEP. With his size of prostate, then he has all options available to him. Um, so I mentioned TURP and HOLEP, but I would explain that those come with uh, a risk to his sexual function, particularly ejaculatory function. Uh, I would explain that there's also options such as green light laser um, and aqua ablation, which are also both fairly invasive uh, and then we've got the more minimally invasive options such as uh, Eurolift and Resume. Um, the NICE guidelines and the NHS England patient decision aids also mention ITIND but that, in my experience that's not widely used. Okay, is there any size criteria for these um, newer modalities? Yeah, so the, the newer modalities have been um, proven um, more in the smaller prostate size so most of them uh, are suggested for use in men with a, a 30 to 80 cc prostate and not not really validated for use in in men with prostates larger than that okay after going through the physician aid uh, the patient is quite interested in the resume so how will you explain this to him and uh, what are your plans so I would explain that uh, resume is a day case procedure, uh, which is routinely done under a general or spinal anaesthetic. It involves injecting steam into the prostate adenoma. So that's the part of the prostate that's become overgrown. 
and the steam um, causes necrosis of the prostate tissues via sort of a thermal effect. He would require a catheter afterwards and he would go home with that catheter in place for uh, usually a week. I would explain that um, that first week or two after surgery, most men have quite significant irritative symptoms and they can have quite a lot of pain. There can be some passage of debris and blood in the catheter. Um, but after the catheter is removed and, and they're on, most men recover quite quickly from the procedure. Um, I would explain that the um, McVary study suggests that there is a good um, improvement in IPSS and QMAX following the treatment, and that most men, um, although we've got limited long-term data, most men have good uh, persistence of that improvement up to about five years down the line. Um, however, there is a small subset, um, about 10%, that would require further intervention in that time period. Okay, what is the mechanism by which the resume works? Um, so, resume works by causing a thermal necrosis of the prostate adenoma. So, the uh, machine has a, a needle which is injected into the prostate and steam, um, steam comes out through the end of the needle, um, very hot. So, it causes a thermal necrosis of the tissue, which um, over time then causes it to shrink down. Okay. And um, after explaining all these things, uh, when you are showing him the information leaflets, etc., he wants to discuss the Eurolift because you placed Eurolift and resume almost of equally of choice. So how will you explain Eurolift to him? So Eurolift is another minimally invasive technique. Um, it's licensed or it's suggested it can be used under local anesthetic in my experience most centers are still using a general or spinal anesthetic for it it basically involves placing um, permanent prostate retractors inside which are made of um, a nitinol um, clips con connected by a um, non-absorbable suture such as proline um, those are then implanted and, re and retract the tissue away from the urethra. Um, you can use um, you can use it to treat prostates of varying sizes by using different numbers of implants, um, and it has now been shown to be useful in men with a median lobe because you can just push the median lobe off to the side and use a clip for that. Um, the um, the LIFT study suggested that it's non-inferior to TURP, um, but in my sort of clinical experience, I'd say men don't get such a long-term outcome, good outcomes from it. Um, we certainly see that, that there is a similar rate of needing further intervention as with Resume, so there's about a 10% need for re-intervention in five years. Okay, so what are all the components of the Eurolift implant? So the, the, it's made up, it looks like a treasury tag. So it's made of two um, nitinol um, small metal bars and they're connected together by um, by a non-absorbable sort of suture material. I think it's proline or similar to proline that connects them. One of those goes in um, through the capsule and that acts as an anchor and the other one is deployed uh, inside the urethra and then the pressure pulls the inside one towards the outside one retracting the prostate okay you said that uh, urolift is doable in a patient with a median lobe is there any evidence to that um i don't know of a paper but i know that there is general experience inexperienced hands most people would now say it is it is doable you most people would say you use your um your scope to press the median lobe laterally and deploy your clip um off to the side Okay. Is there any role for Eurolift in men with retention, urinary retention? Um, yeah, so there's a Pulsar study that suggests that there's um, up to 80% of men who have been catheter dependent um, will be catheter free and remain catheter free up to six months um, after um, the procedure. But there's limited sort of longer term outcomes for men with retention. Okay. Uh, in the last minute, what do you know about ITIND? Um, so ITIND 
is uh, Itin was very, everyone was very interested in Itin about four or five years ago, and um, it made it onto all the patient decision aids. But in my experience, I've, I've never seen it used, and I don't know any centres that are using it. But ultimately, it's um, a nitinol basket, which is deployed into the prostate and works by sort of slowly creating longitudinal incisions in the prostate, um, causing sort of pressure necrosis in those areas to open it up. Um, There is a study, uh, the urology study, which um, compares it with a sham. And actually the both arms, the sham was just a catheter and both arms had good improvement in IPSS. Um, So I don't think there's a huge amount of evidence for its use at the moment. Okay, uh, what is the material the IT uh, implants are made of? Uh, it's nitinol, another nitinol. Okay, okay. so how long the implant will be kept? Um, I think the implants usually left in between three and five days and then removed. It's quite, it's nice because it doesn't necessitate a catheter, so they don't have, a, have to have a catheter in whilst they're having the treatment. Okay, that's good. The time is off now, so we will stop now. How do you think you Thank did? You. Um, I think it's okay. No. I I think I know, I understand, I think, how most of the technologies work, which helps. Yeah, that's good. So for this scenario, I think your performance is, is, is more than good. And um, I'm quite happy with the, the flow. And you're able to make major decisions based upon the size of the prostate. And uh, you have not given too much of weightage to TURP and uh, lift the newer technology on the sidelines. That's okay, maybe two years back. But nowadays, the newer technologies are much more upfront and it's nice to decide and uh, discuss it equally. And um, just into the nitty gritties from here and there. And um, I'm glad that you are able to correlate the importance of the patient's wish to preserve the sexual function. That will make a big impact on what energy source you are going to use for its uh, prostate. And size of the prostate is important and the median lobe is important. So I've given you a lot of information like, for example, IPS score and flow rate, but I've not given you the flexible cystoscopy. So it's a good practice okay. that you may have asked for a flexible stroscopy or you can say that I will do a flexible stroscopy because of the availability of various newer modalities. And, yeah, um, to assess the prostate anatomy. Yeah, and you can bring in like a one-stop uh, LUTS clinic. You can evaluate them yeah. because that is well supported by the GRIFT also. And yeah. uh, regarding the decision-making aid, I think you mentioned about the NICE guidelines decision-making aid, but it's more of a GRIFT guidelines grift decision making yeah. aid and yeah. uh, since you said and you're traveling towards the decision making aid the usual flow will be like what are all the components of the decision making made how a one-stop luts clinic may work those are all the usual questions we discussed this briefly yesterday so i don't want to repeat it today overall yeah. patients should get the all necessary things in one go and should go home with a uh, decision of which one he is going to use yeah. and um, we discussed the resume first resume you have said you can be done under GA and local there is some good push to do the resume under the local I mean you said GA and spinal but there is a good push to do this resume even for the local anesthesia so it can be done a good prosthetic block can help to have the resume done so when you're explaining the procedure it's a nine seconds injection of water vapor and you need to use the term convective water vapor therapy so this works by the principle of convection and the previous one like transurethral needle ablation transurethral microwave treatment they used the methods of uh, uh, conduction so that's the main difference there so that's the only selling point to see whether that will help us to make this resume better than the failed treatments of transurethral microwave therapy or transurethral needle ablation which failed 15 years back so it's a convective therapy and uh, it uses a predetermined needle which goes to a predetermined depth and once you activate the handle it will give a 9 seconds of uh, 108 or 105 degrees celsius quite high water vapor 
and uh, it emits from the tip at three different angles uh, each 120 degrees uh, within them so that creates like a three streams covering all the 360 degrees creating a nice water vapor ball and we need to make sure that the the placement is uh, good enough so that the water vapor will not leak through the previous hole so we need to place it at least two centimeters apart and it's equally good for even the median lobe but median lobe should not be huge it should be like less than a centimeter or centimeter and half that's for the resume for the euro lift again i'm happy with your level of evidence and um, level of knowledge but few other things like for example the euro lift has got three components the central suture which connects the two metallic things is a pet suture it's a uh, a pet suture and then the the both arms are like urethral end and the capsular end the capsular end is made up of nitinol and urethral end is made up of stainless steel and the pet suture the pet stands for polyethylene tetraphthalate it's nice to know a few things so that that will give you a good mark since you are at one stage like i wish you to go a one step higher than what you are now yeah. and um, other than that um, you, are, you are quite good with the surgical treatment rate you just averaged it out to like 10 percent in five years it's it's approximately like 13.65 percent in five years small difference is okay small, here and there averaging is okay but as you are getting towards the exam try to remove some averages and make it with some absolute numbers that's how you can be more good and um, the evidences are like lift study which is the first study which uh, compared the euro lift with the trp and helped us to establish the safety approval etc and then we have the bph6 study which is equally a good study showing the good outcomes i, I don't want you to know more about that at least just main studies and there was a cochrane review in 2019 on euro lift and uh, the, for the median lobe the main study which supported is the mid lift study in 2019 it's a little bit important historically also because when Eurolift was introduced, they themselves uh, advertised it as not suitable for median lobe. And then yeah. um, we started using the median lobe. There's a specific mid lift technique, and it also has shown that mid lift Eurolift procedure for patients with median lobe less than a centimeter had much better outcome even compared to the lift surgery. Possibly it's because by the time the consultants are doing the mid lift procedure, they are very experienced. And other thing is we always know that if there is a patient with a median lobe and if the median lobe is tackled even by TURP, they have much, much better outcome because median lobe will cause more obstruction than the lateral lobe. And uh, you, you correctly brought in the pulsar study, which is for the retention, mainly for acute retention. 52 men and uh, approximately 81% of men were catheter free end of the procedure. And a uh, little bit about ITIN, you did well, uh, it's made up of nitinol and uh, once it's placed, uh, it is to be left for 5 to 7 days. It creates 3 incisions, um, uh, you can compare it with the age old Turner Warwick incisions like uh, for blood and neck. ITIN is predominantly very good for blood and neck. It's not good for a very juicy, obstructive lateral lobes. Multiple studies are in progress, especially there is a ongoing UK trial, premise trial, multi-center, multi-arm, comparing ITIN with resume Eurolift and TURP. So I'm just trying to add few things so that um, it gives you a little bit of more meat to your answers. Uh, when I yeah. share the recorded link, the, in the background you can see my uh, learning material. So you can pause the video and you can get much more uh, context from uh, what I'm saying now. Okay? Yeah, thank you. Good. Well done. Um, who wants to go next? I'm happy to go next. Okay, John, because you haven't uh, done yesterday. Okay, so let us continue with the same patient. Let's uh, switch on the timer. So the same patient has uh, got complete good knowledge about this Eurolift and resume, but uh, after getting all the information leaflets, after going home, after discussing with friends in the pub, etc., he was a little bit skeptical on all these newer technologies. So he felt that uh, the, um, the age-old TURP, which uh, 
previous consultant has discussed as a gold standard is also a good one so he wished to discuss with you the TURP procedure how will you explain the procedure to him the same patient John John you are muted I think I, maybe we have lost him. Um, Tara, you want to continue the scenario, please? Yep, sorry. Could you repeat the scenario, please, yeah. Mr. D? It's the same scenario. Say, for example, a 58-year-old man enjoying good sexual life, uh, prostate measuring 60 cc, discussed uh, in the previous scenario, both the options of resume, Eurolift, and also to some extent, ITIN, quite happy with resume, went home, but is now coming back with uh, a disc with a aim to discuss the URP and uh, he's uh, got a voiding test done, uroflometry done, which showed a voiding pattern which is obstructed in spite of tamsulosin and finasteride. So how will you explain the TURP with him? Okay. Um, so I would explain that uh, transurethral resection of prostate is the procedure that we know the most about when it comes to surgical management of uh, prostatic obstruction. It's been around for a long time and we um, have a lot of data about it. Um, I'd explain that it's, it usually involves a general or a regional anaesthetic where we core out sections of the prostate uh, via the urethra. He would have a catheter placed afterwards, which stays in for usually two or three days. Um, and then we would aim to remove that catheter before he goes home. Uh, prior to listing him for a TURP, I would want to perform a flexible cystoscopy just to assess the effect that the resume has had and ensure that there's no urethral stricture that could be causing his symptoms, although the risk of that is very low with a resume procedure. Okay, I mean, he haven't had resume procedure. He had a discussion, but uh, he, yeah, he wants to go for TURP rather than any newer technologies. Okay, okay. How, how will you proceed with this uh, consent and other things? So I would um, explain that the outcomes are very good for TURP. A core new meter analysis in 2015 demonstrated an increase in, sim in um, a symptomatic improvement of 162%. Um, as well as quality of life improvement in over 70%. I'll explain it can be performed using two technologies, monopolar or bipolar. Um, my preference would be bipolar. Uh, we know that the outcomes in terms of um, flow and uh, quality of life are comparable between the two technologies, and that's evidenced from a Cochrane review in 2019. However, um, bipolar energy has a more favourable safety profile with um, elimination of TUR syndrome and um, lower blood loss and length of stay. And that's confirmed by the NICE technology appraisal in 2021 as well. I would explain the risks, uh, the indication for the procedure, what it involves. I would show him the, a video that's available on the BAUS website and provide him with a patient information leaflet. I would explain the um, alternatives, which are the other modalities that have been discussed, and um, the risks of the procedure. I'd explain that there are general risks of pain, bleeding and infection. I'll explain there will be some likely some bleeding into his catheter when he wakes up and not to be alarmed by this. The risk of significant bleeding, according to the NHS England patient decision aid, is 2 to 10 percent. And that's bleeding that requires either transfusion or return to theatre. I'd explain that um, there's a high risk of retrograde ejaculation afterwards which can occur in up to 70% of patients. There's also a risk of urethral stricture of about 5% um, and erectile dysfunction of 1% to 5% as well. Okay, so when you are starting the procedure, let's say this is the operation day for him and uh, he's listed as the first procedure for you. So how will you explain it in the day of the procedure and how will you start the procedure? 
How would I explain it to the patient yeah. in the and, readmission? And start the procedure. How will you proceed with bipolar TURP? Okay, so I would explain. Um, I would explain to the patient. Well, ask the patient if he's got any questions, um, as this has all been discussed previously. Explain the risks, as I mentioned. Um, I would check that he is, if he has any strong feelings about blood transfusion, if that's needed or not. Um, I would ensure he's obviously been kept nil by mouth as appropriate. Um, and then in the briefing at the beginning of the day, I would explain the patient's background um, and that we are proceeding with bipolar TURP. Um, and I would ensure that all components of the machine are working. I would then begin um, in a appropriately consented, prepared uh, patient with all facets of the WHO checklist in place. I would pass a um, 26 French tourist receptoscope, perform a cystoscopy of the bladder to ensure there's no other pathology. I would identify both UOs ensure that we have the right irrigation fluid, which should be 0.9% uh, saline. And then I would begin resecting using Blandy's technique. So I would flatten out the median lobe to increase my irrigation flow. And then I would resect at the uh, 11 and two o'clock positions, um, starting on one side. So start at two o'clock, uh, achieve my depth, and then follow that down to the six o'clock position. Uh, my distal limit of resection would be the veru, and I would take care not to undermine the bladder neck. I'll then perform hemostasis at the end of the procedure once, um, once I have a good cavity uh, with a roller ball, and then I will place a 22 French three-way coude tipped catheter and commence irrigation. Okay. What are all the methods by which this bipolar system work? How it differs from the monopolar TURP set? So bipolar diathermy works by not passing through the patient. So in the case of TURP, there is the um, active pole, which is the resection loop, and the passive pole, which is usually the sheath, and the loop is coated by a ceramic material. This ensures that the current is flowing um, from the active pole to the passive pole and back to the machine, so it avoids any current through the patient. The advantage of that is that it um, patients with a pacemaker, for example, um, have no interference if the pacemaker is it's all running through the machine. Uh, do you know there are another two types of bipolar system, like true bipolar and quasi-bipolar? Do you know the difference? No, I don't. Okay, so we'll come back to that. Okay, this patient had an uneven full TURP, so he's in the post-op ward. You are going to review him in the post-op ward. What will be the usual follow-up for these patients? So in the immediate post-operative period, I obviously want to check that he's safe, well and comfortable, that his observations are stable and that there's minimal bleeding, that there's no palpable bladder. In terms of longer term follow-up, um, I would be guided by the GERFT pathway, um, which would be a three month follow-up uh, with PROMS. So I would arrange a follow-up IPSS, um, uroflometry and post-void residual. Uh, that could be done as a virtual telephone clinic um, providing there's capacity for him to have his flow testing beforehand. Okay, that's good. I think the time is gone now. That's a good comprehensive one. So how do you think you did? Okay, I'm not sure if I misunderstood your question mm -hmm. at one point. I understand. Uh, but it's, it's okay because in, in real true exam, this won't happen like that. I, don't, I just want to save some time and give you more time to talk. So I said... It's the same scenario as the first one, but patient doesn't want resume or euro lift, but let's go in for TURP so that we will discuss the monopolar and bipolar TURP. Um, I think you did well. This is another very basic scenario. So as basic the scenario is, we are not supposed to make any mistakes. We should be very, very clear in what we are saying. While mm -hmm. if the scenario heads towards euro lift, resume, might and yes, there is always a small leeway because most of the examiners may also may not be very well versed with that. Regarding the true bipolar and quasi-bipolar system, 
in in a true bipolar in the resection loop itself there will be a passive pole so the current is very uh, short uh, turn and then the whole current will be taken away by the passive pole while in quasi bipolar system the sheath not the outside of the sheath the inside of the sheath helps as a returning um, returning pole it is not that frequently used but it's nice to know the different types of bipolar in use and um, otherwise your evidences are quite good you have mentioned a few things the few things are like for example the meta analysis you mentioned the q max improvement is 162% but you said ipss improvement as 162% a small changes but, but that will yeah. come with practice and it's not a very big issue and mm -hmm. um, bipolar also has got shorter irrigation time apart from shorter duration of surgery and shorter uh, need for the blood transfusion it's shorter irrigation time that's one of the important outcome and uh, when you discuss the TORP complications, divide it as uh, short-term complications, long-term complications. So short-term like hematuria, TOR syndrome, infection, need for recatheterization, need to go to theater, all those short-term one. While long-term yeah. one like retrograde ejaculation, urinary incontinence, etc. Um, you have brought in the method of Blandis where we cut at 11 o'clock and 12, 2 o'clock, uh, quite accepted method. Uh, there are few other methods also available. Most commonly what we use is the Mermaid's method which is a modified Alcock and Flox modification. We create and clear the median lobe first that will help us to give a good irrigation and then the usual resection is at 9 o'clock or 3 o'clock based upon the surgeon's preference of left hand or right hand. But Blandis mm -hmm. is equally a good one but it's nice to know the other methods also if uh, the examiner is particularly knowing about the other one and uh, i'm happy with your follow-up plan and follow-up plan should be telephone follow-up especially if you're not going to make a big impact and uh, in the three months period the patient will reach us if there is any major problems as long as there is no problems with that uh, a follow-up in three months is good uh, you can do an ipss and quality of life prompts measurement just over the telephone because we just want to make sure that patient has got a good improvement there is no need for a routine flow rate post TRP. Some of the trusts are still doing routine TRP uh, flow rate, not necessary. And routine face-to-face -face supplement also not necessary. In three months time, if he is comfortable, he can be discharged. Uh, just remember, maybe on the day of surgery or at least in the follow-up to mention that he can discontinue the tamsulosin and the finasteride tablets. And we need to ask about his sexual function, how happy is he or he needs any support from the sex point of view. Okay? Okay, thank you. Good. Well done. Um, we got a third person. Um, are you available to do the third scenario? Yes, I'm available. Okay, good. Uh, I think you were addressing me uh, earlier, but uh, uh, I'm not John. Okay, uh, since his name is not there, I assumed John. Sorry for that. Okay. Um, Sorry. No worries. So we will go for a new scenario. So this patient uh, is on tamsulose and infinastrate for the past five years. But uh, unfortunately, now he's presenting with uh, significant uh, difficulty in uh, passing urine and slowness in passing urine, etc. And when you evaluate, uh, you did uh, urophilometry, which definitely showed an obstructive pattern with a Q max of only like uh, 6 ml per second. He voided 600 ml with a residual urine of 200 ml. His uh, prostate on examination is large, more than 100 cc. So you did a uh, flexible stroscopy which showed a large occlusive bilateral lobes with a large median lobe and prostate volume is uh, 150 cc. So how are you going to proceed? So uh, how old is this gentleman? He's uh, 65. I'll I'll see this gentleman in the uh, in the clinic and uh, I will uh, to, um, as as he's already uh, had been on Tamsulos and Fenestride for the last uh, few years. Um, uh, therefore, uh, I will now uh, discuss with him a further uh, invasive uh, 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 surgical options. However, I would like to review his history and would know about if he's on any anticoagulants and would also review his uh, uh, sexual functions and would like to know his 
uh, goals and uh, his uh, priorities in terms of uh, uh, saving his uh, or maintaining his sexual functions. Uh, I will provide the patient with the uh, with the patient decision aid um, uh, uh, for this uh, gentleman um, uh, with uh, with a large uh, prostate of about 150 cc. Uh, he would be eligible for uh, HOLEP um, or uh, uh, more uh, invasive procedures such as the um, open prostatectomies uh, uh, and uh, and. Uh, and but, but however, uh, my decision would be uh, according to how he is uh, planning, how his goals are, and how what he wants to uh, uh, preserve his sexual functions. Okay, um, he wants to preserve sexual function, but having said that, he is more bothered about his uh, urinary symptoms. That is his priority. So he is quite happy to sacrifice the sexual function if that is the only way he can proceed further. So the way by which you are explaining, you are more leaning towards the enucleation of the prostate. So what are the various methods by which we can perform prostate enucleation? Uh, uh, the various options include uh, HOLEP, uh, laser enucleation of the prostate. Uh, there is also uh, 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 thulium uh, laser enucleation of the uh, prostate. and. Uh, then there are the uh, other open surgical options, uh, which can be transvesical or transperineal uh, prostatectomies. Okay. And uh, explain about holmium laser enucleation, why it is a good choice for somebody with 150cc prostate? Um, uh, the, the holmium laser utilizes uh, the holmium YAG laser, which is a pulse laser. And uh, it it helps to uh, enucleate the prostate uh, 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 as uh, 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 down to the uh, down to the capsule with maximum enucleation of the adenoma. Okay. And uh, as compared to the. Uh, previous uh, TURP, uh, it has more uh, long-lasting results in terms of uh, very uh, a few, uh, a very less re-operation uh, uh, percentages in terms of it being about 0 0.2 to 0 0.5% in uh, 10 years, whereas it is for the for TRP, it is about two percent per year, and uh, it has uh, less uh, bleeding, and uh, the patient has a less uh, post-operative uh, stay and early removal of the catheter. Okay, that's good. And what are all the main side effects of holmium enucleation? Uh, the the side effects of holmium enucleation. Uh, uh, include uh, a urine incontinence of about of of one to three percent. Um, uh, there's erectile dysfunction of about three to five um, percent. There is retrograde ejaculation as com similar to what is has been seen in TRP about seven to two hundred percent. The uh, the stricture uh, rate is. Uh, about uh, one to two percent, and uh, the need for uh, going back to theatre for any bleeding is uh, uh, or needing transfusion is one percent. Okay, you mentioned apart from this whole knee manipulation, there are other methods available like prostatectomy. So, what are all the prostatectomy options available for him? So the other prostatectomy options are uh, open prostatectomies and can also be laparoscopic prostatectomy or robot-assisted prostatectomies. Um, the open can be a transvesical or a transperineal uh, uh, prostatectomy. Okay. 
is there any other advances in prostatectomy by using the modern techniques um so uh, these are the uh, laparoscopic and on robot assisted uh, prostatectomies okay so is there any advantage in doing a laparoscopic or robotic assisted simple prostatectomy um it it has uh, i'm not exactly sure okay so do you know any named prostatectomy procedures so there is the young's uh, prostatectomy and the millen's prostatectomy um the young's prostatectomy is uh, is a uh, transvesical prostatectomy and millen's is a, a, a transperineal prostatectomy okay and um, so this patient apart from what we have discussed is there any other option available for him 150 cc prostate uh, we have we have discussed hold me manipulation and other enucleation methods and also simple prostatectomy any other options available for him any newer methods so um uh, a relatively less invasive procedure is the prostatic arterial embolization okay uh, those things like embolization okay embolization is okay but yeah go ahead is there any other thing other than embolization um uh, um we can uh, utilize uh, um uh, no um, i just can't remember okay so tell me about embolization how it works so uh the prostatic arterial embolization um is basically embolizing the uh, uh arterial supply to the prostate uh, which uh, which can be done as a day case and under local anesthesia however it requires um an uh, mdt uh decision making uh, in which the two urologists and two interventional radiologists um it has less impact on it, on sexual function um uh so after after embolization of the uh, of the arterial supply to the prostate there is ischemic necrosis and thereby which decreases the uh, volume uh, of the prostate and helps in relieve the symptoms of the patient uh this is done uh, in the intervention radiology by the intervention radiologist uh, uh, and uh, it, it it involves access by the femoral artery and uh, then uh, and, and then accessing in internal iliac arteries into the posterior arterial branches um the risks uh, are associated with it is that it is uh, technically uh, demanding it has a, it has a high failure rate you need to uh, uh, maintain a vascular access to, uh, to access th- these vessels uh, there is involvement of uh, radiation exposure um uh, there may be uh, there may be uh, embolization of the other vessels uh, to the other pelvic organs such as especially as, as, as the penis um uh, and uh, the, the symptom relief is not immediate and uh, uh therefore uh, uh patient uh, uh, may may need to have a catheter in uh, for some time or uh, and can develop acute urinary retention after the procedure itself and it does have this post embolization uh, syndrome which which has nausea vomiting fever uh, and uh, uh, dysuria Okay is there any evidence to support the prostatic artery embolization uh, the prostatic artery embolization uh, the the landmark study is the rope study which was a uk based study uh, which uh, showed that uh, prostatic artery embolization non inferior as compared to uh, turp okay that's good so any other options apart from pae for this patient um this um green light laser uh 
Okay. Uh, Green light laser uh, vap- vaporization is more for less than 80 cc or maybe 100 cc I will say but uh, definitely not for 150 cc prostate. Any other options for 150 cc prostate? Um, the, the, uh, the other thing is the tulip laser. Is a tulip uh, tulium laser inflation of the prostate. Yeah, that, that's almost similar to Holmium laser. It's all yes, anatomical yes. enucleation. We just change the energy source. Uh, what do you know about aqua ablation? Um, aqua ablation uh, utilizes uh, it's, 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 it's an, uh, trans urethral as well as uh, 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 and, and uh, ultrasound guided, uh, image guided, uh, robotic uh, uh, water jet ablation of the uh, prostate. And uh, it requires a pre uh, assessment of the uh, uh, of the prostate uh, configuration uh, or mapping. And uh, uh, once those configuration mapping has been done, then the, the then the robotic a handpiece or arm uh, delivers high velocity um, a st- stream of uh, water um, transurethrally and it ablates the uh, the prosthetic adenoma and it does not it, it is it does not utilize any uh, thermal energy. Okay. Uh, it usually requires these two passes, and then it is uh, followed by um, a transurethral uh, hemostasis. Okay. Any studies to support this? So um, I'm aware of the water trial one and water trial two studies, uh, but I don't remember the numbers as uh, okay. No uh, worries. What they are, yeah. Good. So your time stops now. So again, a good presentation. The only thing is we need a little bit more uh, smoother flow and uh, more meat to the answer so that it looks much better. So for this patient of 150 cc prostate, I will divide the patient into enucleation procedures, prostatectomy procedure, then minimally invasive procedures like aquablation and prostatic artery embolization. There are only four options for anybody with more than 100 cc prostate. And all the enucleation procedures, you can put it in one umbrella, like holmium based or thulium or green light or even bipolar enucleation. And then you can put all the evidences together. We can label it as an anatomical endoscopic enucleation of the prostate. And uh, when you do, try to bring in some EAU 2024 guidelines. Now it's out now or bring some nice guidelines, bring something so that it's it's, uh, looking good. And say, for example, your value for stricture rate, you said is around 1% to 1.5%. But actually for stricture rate for holmium enucleation is 26 to 4.4%. So your values are very approximated. Sometimes it's nice to even omit the value if you are not going to be quite closer to the actual value. And um, you should know a little bit about the open prostatectomy, simple prostatectomies. So the Millins and Freyer's procedures and how the equivalent of it is used in the laparoscopic or the robotic assisted manner. Um, the Young's prostatectomy is more of transperineal prostatectomy which is not used that much. But uh, the actual laparoscopic or robotic assisted simple prostatectomy is a mimic of trans vesicle Freyer's technique. So that is commonly used. Why they use trans vesicle Freyer's technique compared to trans capsular Millins technique is it gives more space and so robotic arms can be easily uh, used in the trans vesicle manner. So regarding simple prostatectomy, if you are discussing robotic assisted, the best commonly used technique is trans vesicle Freyer's technique. And uh, other than that, uh, you should know a little bit about aquablation and um, you are good in explaining things, but uh, don't forget aquablation because the water 2 study has clearly proven the evidence of aquablation for the prostate measuring 80 to 150 cc. That's why I made the scenario 150 cc so that you can discuss the aquablation. 
and other than that people won't spend much time on aqua ablation when you are discussing prostatic artery embolization uh, you should bring the uk rope study yourself rather than somebody asking you so overall today we have comprehensively tried to discuss the complete package of the surgical treatment available so the scenarios are predominantly like less than 80 cc prostate more than 80 cc prostate anybody with more than 80 cc especially more than 100 cc prostate discuss only anatomical endoscopic enucleation of the prostate with various techniques like holmium green light to lium or bipolar the other options are aquablation and uh, prostatic artery embolization and also simple prostatectomy in the form of either open or laparoscopic or robotic so that's the main thing so don't miss the main options available coming to the less than 100 cc prostates uh, it's only torp bipolar predominantly monopolar is almost out of asian at least in uk less than 80 cc then you are bringing in eurolift resume less than 60 cc you are bringing in itin so remember like that so itin is the most minimalist one predominantly for bladder neck as we discussed yesterday and uh, it's not for very meaty juicy later low prostates not for median low less than 60 cc up to 80 cc you can bring in eurolift but again eurolift is only for median lobes less than one centimeter intravesical projection well resume can be done maybe even for 1.5 little bit larger median lobes again the maximum cutoff is 80 cc so this is the overall preamble um, anybody has any burning questions before we conclude today's session yeah um are there centers that in the uk that are performing itind yeah yeah we are performing we just started now in uh, birmingham city hospital and okay. uh, so yeah if i'm correct i think itind is done in four to five centers um, okay. newcastle is a little bit on the leading side and uh, yeah. uh, yeah and we are doing this premise study which is like a four arm multi-center multinational study comparing itin eurolift resume and turp they won't ask much on itin if you know few things like it's a nitinol based one it creates the turner warwick like three incisions at 12 o'clock seven o'clock and uh, five o'clock uh, it can be kept uh, under local anesthesia and it can be removed under local anesthesia and it is left for five to seven days and those five to seven days can cause significant uh, storage symptoms um, in fact in the first presentation the side effects of resume um, we have used the word like irritative symptoms so don't use those irritative symptom words use the words like more of ics standardized storage symptoms yeah, ITIN is, is very much in practice, but apart from what we discussed in this one hour, I don't think they will ask anything more than that. Okay, thank and, you. Yeah, ITIN has got various publications like uh, MT1, MT3, MT5, they're all like medical technology, one study, five study, three study, but they're all quite preliminary studies. There is, the premise study may be one of the main study for ITIN, like for example, like a lift study, mid lift study, BPH2 study, and Pulsar study for Eurolift. Premise study will be the first main study for the ITIN. Okay, any other questions? Good. Thank you. Good.